account bot or no, you just call me KB, whatever. KB, okay. KB. <laughs> um, could you do us a favor and introduce yourself to our listeners? Uh, yeah, I'm. You know, I'm the artist known as KB. It's not really anything like that. I'm mostly just, you know, right now me and uh, my my buddy Ed Man, we we do a podcast, one of those t- kinds of things uh, about various topics, uh, like 17 hour shows about Iran Contra that engage in uh, insane historical reconstructions that are incredibly punishing for the listener, I hope. Uh, you know, currently we're working on, <laughs> actually, uh, I was at the Columbia University like special collections on Tuesday. I got in to scan like uh, seven boxes worth of, of papers of this uh, Hungarian prime minister, Frenek Nagy, for, uh, who was like the prime minister of Hungary when the Soviets came in. And he, he you know, and his government went into exile in America and worked heavily with the uh, CIA on Radio Free Europe. So that's kind of like <laughs> one of the things that we're going to be covering in an episode, uh, <laughs> probably the next one. But nice. um, why would why would you be looking into him specifically? And I'm saying this is someone who has no idea who he is. Yeah, uh, that's a very long story. The, the <laughs> idea here is that well, the the point here is that we're the most uh, focused kind of thing that we're looking at is something called Permindex. And Permindex stands for Permanent Exhibition. And it was something that was built for the Italian Olympics in 1960. And you have to understand that Mussolini had wanted to do a World's Fair in 1942. It was never, they weren't able to do it, obviously, because of the war. But they had engaged in a lot of like uh, construction and stuff and, and pursued this project. They had crazy, crazy plans for it uh it was going to be called like e42 and they were gonna they wanted to build like a humongous like arch basically this is where the the um st louis arch comes from the, it's like oh, the, wow. it looks exactly the same to the point where people speculate about whether or not that it was actually plagiarized from this design for the fascist world's fair of 1942 uh-huh. in italy but you know they had these hugely ambitious like construction projects for you people are probably familiar with like a, Hitler's uh, how he wanted to redesign Berlin and everything, and they had all these huge models and stuff. It's the exact same kind of deal with the the architecture that Mussolini was trying to do for this World's Fair, but that never happened. So uh, at some point, they decided during the the fifties that they were going to reuse all this con- you know construction that had been started and never finished to develop a new district in Rome, which is called today EUR. Uh, you know, it's a big district in in Rome that you know, has been built out a lot, but at that point. Uh, there wasn't anything there. And so one of the first kind of things that got established was this something called Permindex, which is kind of a World's Fair type of deal. Uh, So really we were talking all about World's Fairs because if you know anything about the JFK assassination lore, there's some stuff in there where the the (laughs) prosecutor- I know we were going to go there quite so soon. (laughs) Well, (laughs) No, go for it. (laughs) The process, Jim Garrison in his prosecution is he- went into the subject uh, of a permindex because he was he was going after this guy named Clay Shaw and Clay Shaw ran something in New Orleans called the Trademark and for whatever reason he was on the board of directors for permindex and that you know has been mystifying for a very long time about what is the significance of that even a lot of people you know mostly people just think it's like a dead end or some weird coincidence or like nobody even knows what permindex is for most of the you know, uh, over the years, the info that people have had about it has been like a couple of newspaper clippings of like Fernak Nagy uh, announcing Permindex because that's he's the um, the president of Permindex, and no one has really known much about like what it is or like you know all types of speculation. So what we've been actually doing is going into a lot of reconstruction of what the trademark is and trying to understand all that stuff because. It was actually started in, um, you know, the late '30s. Based, uh, the whole redevelopment project for New Orleans began with something called International House. So the businessmen associations in New Orleans had wanted to compete more with Miami for uh, trade as a as a port with uh, Latin America, right? And so they started coming up with these plans, and they also wanted to make a World's Fair for New Orleans as as in order to to do that. But also because of the war, they they had to call it off. So uh, they needed to come up with like a backup project or an idea like that. And they had been working with uh, the 
secretary of state at the time. His name is Cordell Hull. And so they went, they went to this, back to the State Department and said, we, we still want to do some type of organization to promote trade with Latin America. Well, what can we do? And so they actually called in, uh, you know, the, the, the office of the, the um, coordinator for, Latin America, uh, for Inter-American Affairs, right? That's a, a, you know, an old school branch of the government. If you know that anything about this, you'll know that automatically uh, it's really fucked up because I'm, uh, you know, the, the person who ran that was Nelson Rockefeller, if you're not aware. This is a, a kind of a big deal where Nelson Rockefeller, if you don't know, uh, basically like ran like a whole empire in South America through a, a development conglomeration called IBEC for many years. <laughs> and uh, before that, uh, he was in the State Department, right? And he actually ran the State Department's office for Latin American policy, like during World War II and stuff. So <laughs> uh, they went to basically Nelson Rockefeller and they said, what do we do, Nelson Rockefeller? And uh, Nelson Rockefeller's father, John D. Rockefeller Jr., in 1920 began what was is what's known as like the International House Movement. Mm -hmm. And the first one was started in New York City in 1920. He, and John D. Rockefeller Jr. then donated one to Berkeley. And then the third one was donated to University of Chicago. I, you know, I, I went to University of Chicago. So there, there's uh, this thing there called International House where international students uh, use it as a dormitory. But they also have a lot of like, cultural uh, events celebrating different like holidays and things uh, for the the nations that the students there come from and they hold like talks from different scholars on international relations and, and different topics and uh, you know I, I never knew this but that these international houses come from uh, John D Rockefeller jr and his his uh, control of the Protestant modernism movement around that time but uh, anyway, Nelson Rockefeller said, okay, we're going to, uh, how about we do an international house in New Orleans, right? And so he got that all set up and he, he made, uh, you know, he handpicked the first director from his staff at the State Department and all this stuff. And so from the success of international house, then going into the 40s, they, uh, you know, built on that as uh, the the foundation for this all this redevelopment they wanted to do, like port uh, expansion and they wanted to modernize their airport and they worked with Pan Am to do that. And they also uh, started a free trade zone, which I don't know if you know this, but every uh, like duty free area and every airport in the country is registered and has a number assigned to it as a free trade zone. And that's based on a law um, that was put into effect during the great depression after the, uh, the, the, the tariffs were raised. Right. And so they, were worried that trade got locked down based on that. And they thought, uh, we'll do this to mitigate it. We'll have a duty-free kind of thing. Uh, the first one was set up in New York. And then the second one is this one that they built in New Orleans. Uh, so it's actually FTZ2. Uh, but you know, the, the other part of the project was then this thing called Trademark, which was like, you know, it's like the world's, uh, tr the World Trade Center, the first one of those, or, or the, that's where kind of the whole idea of the World Trade Center, like, you know, the New York one comes from. There's actually something called the World Trade Center Association, which owns the the rights to the brand World Trade Center, and it licenses that to all the World Trade Centers all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but the whole point is that this guy, Clay Shaw, who was the, you know, the prime suspect that Jim Garrison had in this, you know, case about the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, that he ran the trademark and that he also was on the board of Permindex. And the more you start to look into it, and this is where it actually becomes relevant to the, you also, you, I mean, I'm sure you can understand now, like why the shows are like 17 hours and stuff, but, uh, <laughs> so just, you know, because Fernak Nagy is the president of Permindex, we were looking around and we realized, um, that one of the, the directors at the same time of International House at that point was this other guy named Paul Fabry. And who's Paul Fabry? But, you know, he was a member of Fernand Nagy's government in Hungary before they all had to flee. So, you know, these these guys are like obviously very connected to one another. And, you know, for this, if you're unaware, like Radio Free Europe was started by Alan Dulles, 
Um, and the, the way that it got funded was through this thing called Crusade for Freedom, which the CIA used to launder a lot of money and to do things like um, you know, finance a lot of propaganda uh, for the 1948 Italian election. Uh, you know, if you, you, you read um, Saunders, so you probably know a bit about that. But, you okay. know, they, they use some of the stuff like Crusade for Freedom to do a bunch of money laundering to fund that stuff. And so, uh, you know, Nagy worked really closely with Radio for Europe and, and was involved in all this stuff. And, you know, during World War II, the, the OSS head for Southwestern Europe was this guy, Frank Wisner, who, you, if you read that book, you, you know, too, is he was the um, head of the uh, Office of Policy Coordination at the CIA. So he was actually really close with, with Nagy because they, they, you know, he had run that whole region during um, World War II. So, uh, you know, all these things kind of fit together. There's way more to it, but we went and got these documents is the point. And, you know, there's a bunch of folders in there for uh, Radio Free Europe and for Permandex and stuff. And we, you know, we hit the mother load, of like hundreds of pages of stuff about Permandex, which nobody has ever reviewed before. So it'll be an exciting show to go through that and see. Can I just say something? What? That, well, because we asked you to introduce yourself and actually it's such a perfect way to introduce yourself. It's almost <laughs> as if, if I was on your show and you said, Holly, could you introduce yourself as if I per- started performing one of my songs? Yeah. Like yeah. you essentially like performed yourself. In a way yeah. that like, and I don't, I don't mean that as a, I don't mean that as an insult. I, I no, mean no. that as a, <laughs> no, it's, I, it's almost like it's kind of like a snapshot into your practice as a, as a researcher, or I don't know what you consider yourself, like a para-academic, or I don't know what you call No, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing the Lord's work, just regular research. <laughs> I don't, I don't make any uh, big distinctions about it or anything like that. It's just, uh, I think that, you know, the, the stuff that we do, even though it, you can, uh, when you start getting into some of this stuff with like JFK and stuff, it, it people, uh, there's there's a lot of research and unserious stuff out there, but we take what we do really seriously. We don't always focus on stuff like that, but we're also interested in, you know, lots of different topics, just like uh, political economy and the, the history of like e- economics and, and all different types of stuff. So uh, we, we, we tend to, when we do topics like that, really focus on doing a lot of original research and trying to get at some of these weird material uh you know, motivations and connections that underlie these, uh, these so-called conspiracy theories. I'm a, I'm a fan of like demystification. So that's kind mm-hmm. of what we go after. Yeah. It's funny. It's, it's good that we're going to be talking about like taxonomy of information. Cause while you were talking, it was like, you were going down one thread and then you're like, Oh yeah. And there's this other guy who did this. And have you ever, yeah. seen, have you ever seen like, um, Mark Lombardi's artwork? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that no, that's really cool. A, a lot of people say that. Yeah, no, a lot of people do uh, have specifically referenced that uh, when they talk to me, and he's just like, yeah, we, I love, I love that stuff. I mean, I have like huge folders with like uh, images of like every uh, diagram and like data visualization like that I ever have seen that I save, and it's like, I have, you know. <laughs> So well, that that's actually a nice segue into this project that you're working on right now called Lull, because is, that's one of the kind of goals of this project, right? It's kind of a research tool that can help you organize your thoughts and share share those thoughts with others, etc. Do you? Yeah, mind this is us no. That? This is uh, just kind of a little a little thing that I'm just trying to get going in terms of like some open um, source development because I have struggled for a long time with just what options and solutions there are on the market right now to do research, to handle a library, to, I don't know if, have you guys done anything with that type of software? Have you tried any of that stuff before? Which ones? One of the ones that you uh, mentioned in your... Yeah, there's the, that's the thing is that there's so many of them. Like if you want, like if you have eBooks and like PDFs and stuff you want to organize uh, and manage your sources uh, for, for doing research, there's all these different options, uh, programs like Zotero and, and Mendeley and mm-hmm. Citavi. And then it's like, you know, if you want to have kind of a, an all-in-one um, library manager, there's a caliber. But then if you want to do all these other things, like um, if you want to do document uh, creation kind of stuff, you have to use all these other programs like Coda and Notion. And uh, if you want to do oh, yeah. tables, you got to get Airtable. It's like, and all the, all the different software solutions, they're all very 
um, limited kind of in what they allow you to do. They're all built for a very uh, Silicon Valley, like entrepreneur uh, startup kind of way of doing things, which isn't really you know flexible or, or that good for for individuals who just want to do some reading and learn stuff on their own that's not related to like uh you know developing a dating app or something mm -hmm. so uh, i just got really frustrated just because i've tried like every single one of these pieces of software and they all like none of they none of them do what you really want them to do and then in order to actually uh, get like kind of a whole research loop going of all the different tools that you need you need to do all these kind of uh, tenuous integrations between like six different apps and it's just like it's such a pain in the ass so you know i right now i mean i'm trying to just do like an open source project that will be very modular that will allow people to just uh, you know extend it as they need to add new features as like these little modules that will allow them to have an all-in-one kind of uh platform for research and for um collaboration on academic projects and things like that, that is, isn't going to artificially limit them. Does this cross over with your interest in kind of redesigning or figuring out a more interesting way of using a digital or publishing a digital book or are those two separate things? No, it's, I, it's, I think it's like all those different things are related in like intimately bound up into one another. Uh, you know, and there's so much history here. I mean, this isn't like a problem that's new or only exists in relation to um, internet applications. It's this is like going back to you know fifteen hundred and stuff. People have have been working on these these kinds of things, trying to find solutions to this. Mm -hmm. And you know it, it has an amazing you know amazing history to it, where you realize that all these different things are connected from like uh, graphic design uh, to you know filing cabinets to all these different things. Is that they're all kind of you know they have a secret history that running through them all that. Is, is a lot of people aren't aware of. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about Lull? Who is that how you pronounce his name? Lull? Lull? I, I believe so. I'm not like a, a philologist or anything. Um, <laughs> I'm just like a dumb guy. So I don't know if you've done an episode where you talked about this before or not, but it's it's something that some people uh, probably know a bit about. It's not like a super obscure thing by any means. It's, it's actually uh, going back to um, like the time, like Cicero, is mm -hmm. there used to be this thing called the art of memory mm -hmm. and people may have a sense of this. Like, I think, you know, Sherlock Holmes uses this. He has like his memory palace. If you've ever watched like any of the Sherlock Holmes adaptations or, or the books or anything, mm -hmm. you, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, that's just like, but beyond that, like it's not something that people really do anymore besides a few, uh, you know, cure you, you know, people doing out of curiosity or whatever, but back in the, you know, uh, an antiquity uh, memory, was would be very important right if you think about it, it's like we outsource uh the task of memory to books and more increasingly mm -hmm. to also to digital systems too right mm -hmm. uh but in you know around like you know uh the 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 turn of the millennium or whatever uh, in uh you know the the late republic in rome it's they didn't have the that level of accessibility when it came to to writing and writing materials it's, you know they were using stuff like uh clay writing tablets was their huge innovation and uh every the scroll was still the dominant way of uh reading and you know the the book only is like the first <laughs> reference to a book it only is, uh, comes from the roman poet marshall around this time during the flavian dynasty so it's like you have, you have to think about that they they would have needed to cultivate a, a lot of memory techniques in order to deal with not being able to like write down a, a phone number if, if whatever the, yeah, well, music, the roman equivalent of that huge, is music played a huge huge role in that singing these kind of like epic tales mm -hmm. really of course what's the yeah. melody helped augment memory of, yes of, of you would remember stories <laughs> that way yeah huh. yeah and there's something about that too you know if <laughs> Where it's like you, there's some connection between like the ancient poetry and like the hexameter that they used, and like the the rhythm of the like the uh, neurons firing or something. I think it's like it's like goes really deep like that. But uh, you know, the when it comes for uh, the development of like print culture and writing culture literacy, uh, for a long time they had to rely on uh, this thing called memory art, and that actually entailed a lot of, um, you know, it got increasingly sophisticated throughout the Middle Ages. 
really, you find that going all the way back um, to ancient Greek fragments that are mentioning it, but really the main sources for it are like uh, it's uh, Cicero's works on like rhetoric and stuff. Memory is part of rhetoric. Today we have kind of a a, lim a more limited sense of what rhetoric is. Like it's just you give a speech and people agree with it or something like that. But mm. for a long time, uh, up until like the 20th century or 19th century, uh, uh, rhetoric would have been more um, understand more expansively to to deal with these issues of like managing information, like structuring it, organizing it in a more comprehensive way. Because the point is like you need to remember all of the possible arguments you can make regarding certain things. And this is also going right into logic too. Because if you look at like, if you, you know, uh, what a syllogism is, like if you say Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal. If, when you're doing those, when you're uh, writing one of those, the point is, is that you're connecting two different things, two different terms using what, uh, the middle term. And so there, the, if you think about like when it comes to this memory art, uh, what they're really doing is they're classifying all of the different possible connections that exist between different kinds of, of terms of like logical propositions. So, uh, you know, it's it's actually way more dynamic than you you would you would think based on like your high school forensics uh, after school activity or whatever, where it's just like you know it's about talk, giving a, a persuasive speech or whatever. It's not that's not really uh, exactly what it was. So. For you know this this tradition for of the memory art develops in all different types of directions and it's it's dominant for a long time especially throughout the Middle Ages through like scholasticism right and like Thomas Aquinas writes about it and uh, one of the uh, directions that it goes in was this guy Raymond Lull and you know just to go forward a little bit in the Renaissance there's a huge uh, you know, transformation in memory art, uh, and, and because of a few different factors, like with printing and uh, especially with what's called an emblem, in, like the emblem books, um, well, that was a really early kind of genre of graphic design uh, mm -hmm. for for printing, where it, it, it's like little little pictures um, of paradoxical kind of image imagery or like you know uh, shocking imagery or little visual jokes. Uh, if you know i don't know you should you should post one or something somewhere in relation to this episode just so people can know what i'm talking about but mm -hmm. uh, sure. that was a very popular kind of way to remember things right is mm -hmm. the point of these little emblems was that uh they you'd have a book called an emblem book and it would have all these emblems and then it would have uh, an epigram or something associated with the emblem like uh, some kind of uh, moral teaching or like a quotation or or something like that and the point would be that you know, it's like Roy G. Biv. I don't know if you, uh, people use that still, but like when I was in school, they had you remember Roy G. Biv as a way to remember the order of the colors of the, of the rainbow. But, you know, it's a monomic, so just, you know what I mean. Um, but these were like a little visual monomic that people used to fill up their memory palaces, right? Uh, so the point is that you would have a very kind of like paradoxical image or, or something striking, and that by remembering that image, then you could remember what the epigram was. Yeah, it's funny. I've been using an app called Fluent Forever to try and uh, learn German. Yeah. They, use, they use a very similar system. Really? Yeah, they use like flashcard monomics. Um, that makes sense. Where it's like there's always an image associated with a word or like an action associated with the word. And I'm guessing the idea is that... I mean, they do that in children's books as well. Yeah. I have no offense. <laughs> Which is appropriate for my, my level of uh, language, yeah. It's, I mean, this is like a very, you know, just basic monomics. Like we, we still use these techniques today, but we just don't have a comprehensive idea of memory art or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these, these uh, uh, during the Middle Ages or during the Renaissance, uh, they go and get... They build out memory art a lot where originally you were dealing with like you imagined a memory palace and these are explicitly understood as uh, artificial memory. And so they they really have a conception of this as like uh, a virtualization of like uh, a physical space into an artificial internal memory aid. So that's like, you know, it's there. It's already kind of like, you know, they're building a, a filing cabinet in their mind and like. Yep there's a technological aspect to it. It's considered to be explicitly artificial. It's like, uh, you, it gets developed even more into sophisticated, uh, more and more sophisticated structures, uh, during the Renaissance where, you know, Dante's, um, divine comedy, right. 
that is that's a memory system. That the, that book is literally uh, Dante him just describing his whole memory system of how he remembers all these different things. Like that's just you know, uh, so like a, a cosmology like that became got turned into a memory system, and the the, the zodiac was used as a, as a memory system. So people got like really creative, elaborate with it, and then all these emblems. Uh, and all these emblem books, and there was like hundreds of emblem books that were published during this time. Uh, they they provided like increasingly uh, striking, uh, like esoteric and like hermetic imagery, and um, so all those things are kind of coming together. And one there's a huge innovation that happens with um, this this thing. One of the memory structures they come up with is called the memory theater, uh, and the way the memory theater works is that it's like this guy Camillo built it as a literal kind of, uh, you know, half scale model theater. It's like an amphitheater, right? Like literally like it's based on the design of like a Roman amphitheater. Uh, and so you would go inside and, you know, you stand on the stage and you look out into the amphitheater and there's like, you know, seven tiers of seats and, and et cetera, et cetera. And he gets it all set up so that, it, it kind of starts to function like a, literally a, fi a filing cabinet where the point is, is that you look into the amp, the, 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 the seats, the levels of seats and all you, all your information is arranged there, but in like a, in columns and stuff in a structured way, like that exactly like what you would see when a filing cabinet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these types of technologies are just uh, developed continuously and uh, go on to, you know, obviously influence like Francis Bacon and and Leibniz and then so when you people will often talk about uh how Francis Bacon invented science or something or they'll, they'll talk about how Leibniz was influential for computer theory and uh, you know that's that's it's they, I don't think a lot of people uh understand the correct emphasis that needs to be placed on that because it wasn't just that like they were doing uh, an alchemic alchemic experiment of mixing some chemicals around and like that later somebody used that as uh an inspiration for a uh, chemistry idea it's not like that at all it's more that you know they were using all of these advanced structures that have been developed including things like tree diagrams um which is uh, tree diagrams also uh, are part of this um tradition is called the porphyrian tree is actually the first tree diagram from like the third century ad which is like a visualization of aristotle's categories and so it's like they had developed all this technology that got pretty sophisticated by the late renaissance and someone like francis bacon is taking it and using it to make a, a structured diagram of scientific disciplines and knowledge and how that all relates to each other and in, in a coherent system and that's science like that's what science is like, you know, Kant would say, like, define science just as, um, you know, organized information, really. So it's it's like people, you, you, that really is the beginning of science in like a way more direct, literal way than I, th I think people usually take it to mean. But anyway, to go back is that there's this guy, Raymond Lull, who's part of this kind of this tradition. And he's more, he's in the Middle Ages, like in the uh, 14th century or, or 13th century. And he uh, is is transitional in this this whole process and its development into the Renaissance uh, because he's has a very controversial reputation during his own time where he's also is seen he's seen as being possibly heretical uh, and you know there's a lot of disputes over that to to till this day but he deviated from the scholastic memory art to develop his own system which is usually called the the Lullian art of of combination. And so this is like, you know, if you, if you don't know, Le Leibniz is actually the, the, you know, big person in the history of like combinatorics, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what this is also like, this is where that comes from as well. Like modern, like mathematical combinatorics is just based on like Leibniz doing uh, lowly and like combination wheels and stuff. So, uh, but he is, his version of memory art was, a, you know, a, a bit stranger, a more idiosyncratic and, the way that it works is that it's divided into different parts uh, and it's like three different parts. Um, and the part that's associated with memory involves like 
not only memorizing different facts and things, but also memorizing the entire kind of theoretical structure of the Lullian art itself. So it's like a whole thing that like seeks to understand itself and like comprehend itself. And it it's actually one way you can really characterize it is that it's kind of an investigatory method. And it's like, this is kind of, um, as you see going throughout the, the, the history of philosophy is that there's all these attempts like to develop kind of a way of researching things or a way of learning things or coming up with knowledge or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in a more, yeah, in a more general way, like not just like they want to come up with a general theory of like how to know things. Right. And that's what, you know, this lolly in art really is. Uh, and, you know, that obviously goes on to like Descartes method and, and things like that, where that's also a big part of the process of the development of science is, you know, a generalized way of knowing things so all these st- things kind of come together in law he does all these crazy tree diagrams and all this combinatoric stuff and you know it, it's a a really wild kind of uh, character but the whole history is really crazy because it, you know obviously turns into uh you know by the late 19th century it becomes like the early computer industry filing cabinets mm-hmm. and stuff uh mm-hmm. ncr national cash register like burroughs corporation and, and things like that which all start off selling filing cabinets and, and office supplies for for organizing you know files would it be fair to characterize so like if there was a difference between these kind of memory theaters and the lullian kind of Leibniz like I was looking at this a little bit earlier and Leibniz characterized Lull as the R's combinatoria right um, mm-hmm. Leibniz he disagreed he actually disagreed with Lull uh, a, a fair amount um you know this was the formative background for people like Bacon and, and Leibniz so they they were striking out in a, a new direction in a lot of ways from that but they were Using this, this was the, like the the starting point, like the basic intellectual kind of context, which everyone had accepted at that point in terms of building that out forward. Mm-hmm. But it seemed to me like at least from the, the pictorial representations of the two with the memory theater stuff I'm looking at right now, it's like spatial, but like seemingly quite arbitrary. And then the Lullian stuff seemed to be more like the establishment of like matrices that's right yeah. where it's like or like it's almost like concentric circles where like i was trying to think of an analogy but it's like you could move the elements around and then you could compare the different elements to one another rather than just be, them just being like arbitrary plotted in space is that this fair? is no this is a big deal because actually this is something that there's another another person in this tradition his name is like uh robert flood right and there's actually a debate that ends up happening in terms of how emblems should be used like i was mentioning these emblems and so a lot of the emblems are like just things like a picture of a skeleton or some like weird picture of like a fish wearing a funny hat or some shit like that. <laughs> uh, and, and so you know, these were, had this very kind of limited monomic ability. And there's a distinction that ends up getting drawn between the round art and the square art of emblems, right? Where mm-hmm. people like Bruno and, and Flood, they start moving into a, a direction of abandoning, abandoning these kind of more... Uh, literally pictorial representations, and they start generalizing um, emblems into uh, more, you know, structural diagrams of knowledge. Which is where, if you go back, at, you know, you look at all these uh, alchemical, um, you know, emblems and stuff. You, you know, what I'm talking about. It's all like these geometric matrices, right? And in, in, uh, inscribed in a circle, and you know. You know what I mean? You post a picture yeah. of that too, so, so people yeah, yeah. Can, can know. But uh, that what they're really doing there is they're they're trying to generalize systems of knowledge and represent them like as a structural diagram, which then they can use to you know um, you know as as a data visual visualization. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but that's the point is that they they move into this, like you said, the the these matrical representations, right? And the the thing with Leibniz is Leibniz has his own project, which is very involved uh, and mysterious. And um, actually, uh, Kurt Gödel at one point like apparently came near madness because he was convinced that the Leibniz archives were withholding information about this project that Leibniz had. Where what what, Le- what Leibniz wanted to actually do was um, 
he wanted to create a universal language. And that, that requires like a, some explanation about what it actually he, he meant specifically. Uh, it's one of, there was a bunch of different projects during the 17th century about creating artificial like universal languages. And Leibniz was not the only person to do this. There's like a, a guy, like other people like Wilkins and, and Kirsch, Kirschner and lots of other kind of people were tapped into this as well. But what the idea of it was for Leibniz is that he wanted to make like a symbolic logic that would uh, be a universal language that would apply to metaphysics, mathematics, and, and science, and would uh, be able to represent all the concepts of, of, of you know, those fields in a symbolic way. And his ideal here was that, you know, he wanted, he, he was looking into a lot of like Egyptian hieroglyphs and also Chinese character systems, because mm -hmm. he, the way that he wanted to do it was like, as very pictorial kind of constructions, his idea is that you would have an alphabet of basic um, concepts of, of, of science and math and, and metaphysics. And that the way that it all worked is that you would use this alphabet to build up more uh, uh, complex concepts as uh, combinations of the, yeah. the members of this alphabet. And by making those you know, combinations, you could use combinatorics then to automatically cycle through and make every possible combination of the elements of this, this alphabet, right? And thereby, uh, theoretically, create like an, in, uh, a list of every possible concept. Uh, and this, this is all very linked into Leibniz's overall metaphysics and his ideas about monads and substance, because he also like, this is, he's, this is how he treats like a monad too. Like there's, there's simple monads and complex monads and the, you know, the, the simple ones, they build up into complex ones. And so what he's, what he's like really saying is that he wants to create, um, a language that literally represents it's uh, what's being represented, right? That it's completely visual. So in his mind, you would be able to look at a character and that you would be able to intuitively and visually know what it was denoting uh, because it would literally look like that thing's a conceptual structure or, or something of, like that. You know, this is all very disputed. I mean, he, is, not, he, he didn't make this, but, you know, he worked on it for a very long time. Can I ask a quick question? Is there a reason why he chose a pictorial language rather than a mathematical language? And it, it, this is a mathematical mean? language in, in in this sense. I mean, this is okay. a formal. It's it's meant to be a formalized, you know, symbolic logic. So it's okay. it's because it seems it, in a sense like it like it, a programming yeah. language, right? yeah, or like a, an early ember of like what a programming language could do because you can you can contain yeah. concepts and objects and then combine those objects to produce infinite well yeah stuff. but then it's explicit you know that's exactly what you want to do because his explicit intention then was that he was going to use uh the you know this type of late scholastic logic that was associated with this guy uh peter ramus to basically you know in logic there's uh, the idea of predication where you're uh you know a predicate is just an affirmation of a property belonging to the subject term of like a proposition so, uh, you, you, in logic, you, what, what? <laughs> that was the first time our eyes went, okay, slow down. <laughs> Please continue. That was just the first time Holly and I looked at each other being like, okay, wait, I think I get that. Okay. Well, the brain, the brain was catching up. This is, this is just like very old. This is like, you know, people don't even know, like study this logic anymore. Like, obviously this is like, you know, Aristotelian basic, like logic of like, you know, uh, prior analytics and, and things like that. It's you know, what a predicate is, is all it is. is a logical proposition is just a sentence. It's just it, yeah. a logical proposition uses the word like is or are to predicate and basically say that Socrates is a man, which it, they're basically, that just means that they're, they're predicating or affirming that, uh, you know, this property belongs to Socrates, right? And it's in a categorical relationship with one another. So, that, you know, Socrates is contained within this broader category of man. Um, that That's all that, it, you know, it, I'm, this refers to. So, uh, you know, uh, I think I think people are, should be aware of that. But it's actually kind of sad on a digressive kind of tangent is that uh, there's, there's not like a real textbook out anymore or anything like that, which just teaches like this this old logic 
right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which I find like crazy, but you know. Maybe you need to write a digital textbook that has a new interesting interface. This is what, uh, it's somebody, what, no, what, somebody out there, people, you guys are so fucking lazy. Every, everybody's <laughs> like, you do this, you do this. And I'm, I'm over here, I'm over here, uh, you know, already going through all this, all this history, reading this stuff all the time, trying to build an app and do all the research podcasts to uncover like all the secrets of the JFK assassination and stuff. It's like, I'm, I'm one man, I'm one person. You need a bot. Combo. Well, yeah, no, but this is, this is why I'm making it. It is a late. good point though. It is a good point. It is unusual. It is unusual that these conversations actually are quite rare even though like i mean i'm quite enjoying just the flow of like listening to a history of logic or of a means of structuring an argument um it it does feel like it does feel quite a shame that that this stuff this stuff feels quite as esoteric as as it does when when it's like the building blocks of foundational yeah it's genuinely yeah this is all it is is to go to aristotle what aristotle does is he just engages in a, a basic like logical classification of the different ways that sentences could be constructed, right? That's all that it is. Is that yeah. he's just like, uh, you know, uh, in 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 philosophy and like the tr- tradition of metaphysics, the the I, thought is synonymous with a logical proposition, which is synonymous. You know, it's like it's like these are all the same things. Is that you're just saying something, you're just making a proposition or asserting uh, or predicating that you know uh, something has a property of something. It's like uh, that all Aristotle is doing is he's just going through and and kind of thinking about and saying, well, there are this number of possibilities of different ways that you can write this kind of sentence, and that's all. That's all that it is, and that's how he built out his whole. So life. to go back to tools for organizing stuff, right? Like, so we talked. I'm just going to jog people back. Uh, we talked a little bit about the memory theater, which I think is a really vivid. It's a really vivid image. We can also share an image. This is the crazy thing too, is that nobody knows whether or not this existed. I, th- I actually think that they, people, they, uh, if I remember, they, they generally is a consensus that it did exist, but it obviously never survived. And I don't think there's any pictures of it that were drawn or anything, but it's a guy, Julio, Julio uh, Camillo is his name, right? And he was, uh, you know, this is this is like around 1500 is when he builds the memory theater, right? And he's sort of a, a, a kind of a professor that goes around uh, and and is patronized by a few uh, different aristocrats in like Italy and France. And so he has this huge reputation at the time um, for this memory theater, but, but like no, a lot of people, you know, hadn't seen it. Not many people had seen it, but there's like all these rumors about this memory theater and like mm. what it was like, and you know, and it's it's all structured in a a way where it's, you know, it has tons of esoteric like symbolism in it of, of how it uh, uses the structure of the amphitheater. And, you know, uh, there's a whole metaphysical dimension to the way it's designed and how, you know, what, what kind of knowledge is situated in each tier of seats, which like follows a whole cosmological model of like, you know, it's like, it's a very detailed way to do it. But what I was thinking, where I was trying to go with it is like, can you think of any analogous uh, places in which a similar logic is explored? Because when you were talking about it, the first thing that came to mind, so for example, I'm not a gamer, but when I was a teenager, I was a gamer. And the ability of like organizing memory in virtual space, for example, is something that's quite common if you think about open world games, for example, right? Mm. Like you have like it's quite remarkable how well you can kind of, you know, navigate certain familiar territories in those worlds. And like, you know, where you've like dropped the sword or whatever at some point, or like I was playing Zelda on a plane last year and like, you know, you, you're supposed to like cook and it's like, okay, well I left some herbs in this place over there. Right. Um, But I'm wondering like, are there any, are there any contemporary examples thinking about developing tools? Well, like, you know, it's, it's like, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, um, no, I'm just no, eager just all the time. Like, no, no, it's great. Don't <laughs> worry. Don't worry. I have, I have a similar problem, so I'm very sympathetic to it. Um, but the are there any contemporary examples that you would say are a logical extension of? Because for me, it's like what you what appears to be established here is you have this art of memory stuff that you. I think you're like a living example of in a sense, right? Because you're you're painting all these pictures, and I can kind of see the neural pathways uh, as you talk, right? And then you have um this kind of Leibniz. 
I'm always I'm gonna continually mispronounce his name. I'm gonna pronounce sixteen I different. I don't different know how times. to pronounce anything. Like I, okay, I you know, <laughs> I've always like, I'm sure every name I said in this episode is pronounced wrong, but you know, I I'm for you know I I forgiving about that kind of thing personally. Like I um you know because we're native English speakers. Yeah, yeah we're, we're just, yeah, we do our best. Just yeah. chill out, everybody. It's like come on. But but so and then you have this like the, the formation of like matrices and this combinatorial logic stuff where you're like, okay, this clearly inspired or had some some kind of say in contemporary computing and like even like you know, we we play a lot with neural networks and like machine learning and it's like clearly there's some there's some comparisons there. But like in terms of developing this tool, you know, what what kind of methods would do you think are missing in the space of like organize like research management? That, that maybe touch on some of the stuff like how does this become how does this become really practical in maybe like an eli5 kind of way this is fundamental stuff because really uh the the idea of spatializing knowledge is basically is what we're talking about is that that's like uh uh has a huge tradition behind it of like going it's like behind everything i mean if you if you really kind of think about the way that that metaphor uh underlies so many ways that we talk about different things and the way that uh if you look through like the bible and like classical literature and stuff uh you're going to find that that it's it, that is often used to to talk about things it's, it's a metaphor this you know saying uh, using a cave or something right or um you know let's see yeah the palace i'm just the I, I, will, I will i just want to like literally tell you an example of this which is fine um so that oh okay in augustine's confessions chapter 8 book 10 begins with an enormous expansion of the internal space and the relative um amplification of the image of the treasure house and augustine says i come into the fields and spacious palaces of memory where there are treasures of countless images it's like uh, there's the you know this is a huge theme running throughout the whole tradition of like consciousness in general i don't know you, you I'm, I, I imagine you guys may, might be aware of there's a, a crazy book called Julian Jane's The uh, Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. You you know that one? I don't. I don't no, no. No. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's nice. I, I get to in, you know that I get to introduce. Uh, no, I love when I can introduce this book to people who haven't read it because it's actually like this is like a kind of a classic, classic, uh, crazy, crazy ass book that I you know love. I think it's totally true uh, for the most part is that. Uh, this is a seventy a guy from the nineteen seventies, a neurologist named Julian James, and he came up with this idea where he said human beings did not always have consciousness in the way that me and you typically experience it. Right? Is that we you know we have a voice in our head that we can control and direct around, right? And we had that kind of experience. He his argument was that like in um, prehistory that human beings did not have that kind of consciousness and actually that they were schizophrenic. Uh, his point is actually that schizophrenia is a vestigial form of consciousness and that oh. it was actually the case that um, in, an, in like a prehistorical times that you, you, the, the brain just hallucinated commands into the other hemisphere, right? And that people didn't have an active conscious voice inside of their mind but they experienced uh it passively through a an auditory hallucination of a voice telling them what to do which is like coming from them and so he this book is you know a, a real classic wow. because he's like arguing he makes he does a lot with uh, literary arguments and stuff to talk about um, mythology and idolatry and like how could that exist how could you know in idolatry in like ancient babylon you that they were um, you know, feeding a stone statue, right? They would put a whole feast in front of a stone statue. They would send like the concubines to go pleasure the statue. And that's really hard, you know, to reconcile with uh, the idea that these people had like some kind of active consciousness uh, because like it was the idea that everybody was just kind of going along with it. Just, you know, nobody wanted to say anything like, guys, this is a statue. Uh <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, no, this is, this is like a classic problem. It's not like, this is not something that Julian James just, you know, you know, thought of, but it's like, if, you know, people for a long, long time have kind of dealt with the, 
the idea of like did the greeks believe their their own myths and things like that yeah yeah and it's like you know if you read like uh plato is that he really you know if you there does seem to be in like socrates's uh you know what he says that he genuinely believes in like the oracle of delphi and you know the uh you know Greek mythology is like that's real to him. So it's a, you know Socrates is kind of known for being like a critical guy. So why did Socrates believe these things were, were true? It's, that's like the whole question um, that but might be answered this way because what he's uh, Julian James argues then is that uh, you know in the works of Homer and like the Iliad, uh, he the descriptions of the different things that happened in that book. A lot of times it's it's like uh, the way it's described is is that the people are being acted on by the gods in this you know hallucinatory way and he actually does a comparison of the imagery to like um you know case studies of schizophrenics and what they say about their hallucinations and things like mm. that it's like you know it's uh, you know i won't go into the whole book it's just a, it's a really interesting book it's, you know this goes into the whole spatialization of memories that uh you you have to think about is consciousness is actually there's like a negativity to it where consciousness is a like an internal space right into which we deposit things like you know uh things that we think about right and this is actually like this is one thing that a lot of people there's like a kind of a crank community out there that who's into julian james and, and things like that uh and they they take it in all types of like mystical directions which i don't even know where they get that from but and my thinking is that that what Julian Jane says is not really out of line for what it, uh, you know the the assumptions and beliefs are of the you know classical metaphysical tradition of like Kant or somebody right if in Kant the idea is that consciousness is an internal negative space and that you know <coughs> uh, states of consciousness and perception are organized uh, linearly as it's like a timeline or like a series of conscious states. And that that's that's the whole idea of it is that it's a you know a negative space and consciousness is not like a yeah you know it's an internal container that we like dig into ourselves the space that we construct inside so that's the idea of you know this is uh, if you Julian James in his book he goes through and does like um, a philological uh, kind of analysis of a lot of the the terms related to consciousness in, in Greek literature. And he really emphasizes kind of like the interiority and the, the negativity of those terms and, and basically how they develop as metaphors and the way that they're used over, you know, s several centuries. And he tries to make the argument that like, you know, that um, active consciousness and that active voice uh, is bound up with those metaphors in that literature. And so this is like the crazy, the crazy thing is like, the point is, is that, uh, it's not that like we write the poetry or whatever describing it, but the 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 poetry and the literature and those metaphors is they construct it at the same time, and it's like a a wheel process, a simultaneous kind of reciprocal thing uh, between the our descriptions and models of things and the things that they are uh, you know supposed to describe, and they develop alongside each other, and it's like, it's like a, you know very. Uh, you know, it's it's this is the this is what philosophy is about. This is what philosophy struggles with over the mm, many really centuries cool. to it's, talk about. It reminds me a little bit like we did some work. Are you familiar with the Chan Operator theory? Uh, no, no, I don't think I've heard of that. So the basic idea is the for a lot of so there's it it is like this isn't this is a a, a subject of much debate. But there, there are there is like a subgenre of like evolutionary musicologists, mm -hmm. and their role, you know, because most musicologists, I'm going to butcher this. I'm sorry if there's any musicologists listening, but most musicology is like very much like the study of music as like a, a human creation, right? Like systems of logic that are structured to like you know pass things on or whatever. But it's very much this kind of like intentional act. Um, and there's a few who look at music and think of its role as playing basically a coordination role for humans before humans really had what you just described as active consciousness. So before humans really had the ability to know what they were doing, they were still using music in a very practical way. 
and the chan operator theory looks a lot at like you know like early flint tool napping and stuff like this like early tool creation um and what it suggests is that there's a concept called entrainment and the basic idea of entrainment that apparently is somewhat unique to humans holly you might be able to correct me on this but i think it's some they argue it's unique to humans but basically humans have a capacity and had a capacity this is the argument had a capacity before they had an active consciousness i think some apes can too some apes can but but the whole idea is that humans can basically coordinate to a pulse to a beat and that um they speculate that tool making was passed down uh from generation to generation before people had the means to write down instructions or communicate verbally a logical sequence of steps to 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 go through in order to make the flint tool instead what they did was they choreographed it to music and so actually all it was is like a process of mimesis where this entrainment you know a beat might happen or and beat can also be interpreted as like a choreography too right like a beat doesn't have to be like a gait of a walk is a beat somehow, right? Like it's a, it's this consistent thing that you're following and can be entranced by. Um, and so the whole argument was that humans used music and rhythm in that way and rhythmic perception as a means of basically, you know, uh, stimulating mimesis that led to tools. Um, th the reason why like this is somewhat interesting or like it comes to mind related to what you're describing is that, it's also a similar assertion that like there was basically a period of time where people didn't know what they were doing and were being led by impulses, intuitions, uh, potentially voices, as you just described, whatever, like whatever that you're in kind of like a haze because you haven't quite taken control of your rational faculties enough to be able to have active consciousness. But that that process was like a very, very significant part and also was a very significant part in the development of early technologies, you know, that these, and that raises the, all these kind of psychedelic possibilities because you're thinking, okay, well, most of us think of technology as a really rational thing, but then, you know, from that uh, kind of evolutionary musicologist uh, perspective, uh, singing and music and rhythmic perception and tool making were technologies that existed before we even had the ability to rationalize about things. So it really complicates things in well, a cool way. Well, that's why we need to start thinking about the devel development of technology as a cultural output rather than just a kind of like separated kind of information, you know, outside of cultural actors, if you know what I mean. Yeah, totally. I mean, but, but that's, I mean, that's what I, I assume we're going to get to with. <laughs> here's, here's, well, here's like one of the, th one of my points that I make a lot that is that the way that especially we talk about things in like at least in American context, but also to a disappointing extent also in like a European context as well, it's very historically kind of disconnected in that like with a lot of uh, stuff about like language and anthropology and the kinds of things that we're talk talking about now is that we, we rely on all these modern theories to tell us these, these kinds of ideas, but uh, what you were saying was just really reminding me of of Gottfried Herder, uh, and uh, something he wrote in 1772, his prize essay on the treatise on the origin of language. Uh, you you're in Germany, right? We yeah. are. Have you gone to Weimar? No. Have you gone to Weimar? I, I don't haven't. think I've ever been there. No, I haven't. You, you guys should go. Uh, you know, I always wanted to go, but it's like there's lots lots, lots of cool stuff there. I mean, uh, but Herder, I don't know. Do they have Herder over there still? Do they talk about him, or do you see a statue of him anywhere? You know who he is? I don't think. So. I mean, there probably is some somewhere, but I haven't. Yeah. It hasn't popped out at me. <laughs> no, really? We oh, well, well, yeah. this is what I'm. This is what I'm talking about. Is because uh, there's no like know, Herder Square or something that's like. Prominent. You know, this is this this is what I'm talking about. Is that people need to uh, go back, be more synthetic, and kind of like reintegrate a lot of uh, the missing historical tradition that I think everybody just kind of gave up on caring about. But uh, that you know, this is Herder was actually Kant's. Uh, you know, best student, and he was pretty much during that time he was the like second most famous and most respected philosopher and, and like writer in Germany next to Goethe. Mm -hmm. And he was actually Goethe's like kind of mentor sometimes. What like mm -hmm. when Goethe was in school in like Strasbourg, going to law school anyway. Um, it's a big publishing house here. Herder Verlag. 
Oh, yeah. That makes sense. It's like, uh, but Herder, uh, he was the, um, like, ecclesiastical minister or uh, administrator of of the Duchy of Weimar. And so uh, he was the the preacher who, like, the confessor of the Duke and his family and stuff like that. But he is the founder of anthropology, right? And, you know, undeniably so. Uh, But uh, a lot of people in the more modern kind of discussion of the of the field and its history is like they don't you know nobody talks about it going back to Herder or what Herder said but uh Herder's wrote this essay on the origin of languages is a very famous important one and he's I mean he's focusing on exactly these ideas of music right the point is is that uh in this in this sense that they have of somebody like Herder's they they view poetry and song as being like the same thing and Mm. the way that they view it as as a historical process is where originally there was you know a full combination of uh poetry like literary poetry and music and it was the same thing and totally indistinguishable is that there was no such thing as uh, a poem that wasn't a song and you know and vice versa Mm. uh and that also they go on to say that like language all language was you know poem and song in the same way as you know when language first was you know invented or, or came into being right uh and so there was a historical process by which these kinds of art were um thought out from one another it's sort of like you know uh for the science nerds out there like with the big bang and all the fundamental forces and it's like at the start of the universe everything is is uh you know the fundamental forces act as a you know single thing and mm-hmm. they're not distinguished with the one another because it all takes place in this you know dense hot plasma field or whatever it's the, it's like the idea here with these genres of art and these mental faculties that are, are associated with them is that really at the the dawn of history or whatever is they were all uh, you know the same thing and indistinguishable from one another, and then as time went on, as they are uh, developed in into more kind of distinct and specialized things that get separated from one another. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know he and this is so when he's writing this essay on the origin of languages, that, that he's echoing what you were just saying. Is all I mean is, uh, and that his view of how uh, language came into being, and he 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 thinks that it was based on the imitation of the sounds of animals and like bird songs and uh, the sounds that nature made, like the sound of, you know, different things. And that humans uh, were appropriating these sounds that they heard and like using them uh, to designate the things that made those sounds. And that, you know, that's how they were communicating with each other about like how to uh, distinguish certain natural phenomenon that, you know, if your buddy hadn't seen like a river before or whatever, you'd make the sound of the stream, I guess. And, you know, that he'd be able to know what a stream was by like when he heard that sound, you know? Uh, so uh, I feel kind of similar to what, to what you're, what you're kind of Yeah, totally. At. In fact, we were watching something not long ago. Have you ever seen, oh, there's a village in Turkey, I think, where they still speak in a bird song. It's almost like Morse code, but with whistles. It's unbelievable. And they still teach it. It's in, wait, I'm looking it up. It's called, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this because it's in Turkish. Kush, Kush Dili, which literally means bird language. And there's videos we watched. Do you remember? We watched, like, there was like a, a documentary on it. And basically, you know, it kind of just sounds like farmer calls or something, but they use it with each other. It sounds like whistles. I mean, I couldn't understand it, but intergenerationally they could understand it. Exactly. And it's super complex. It's like, you know, the guy's there and he's like, can you tell that guy gives them a challenge and gives them a sentence and they communicate the sentence in this bird song. Then he goes to the guy at the end at the other side of the farm or like the other side of the mountain and ask the guy what he said, and the guy uh, translates it to exactly what this quite complicated right, sentence was. Right, that's the was. thing, is because it can like bounce around the mountain so easily, like you can call really far distances with this kind Which of Which is the origin of a lot mm. of mountain singing, right? Yeah, but this is a kind of cruelty of um, uh, archaeology of, of this kind of, this particular kind of area of interest, because these things did not leave physical traces behind. Like we can see what kind of physical tools people were using, but we we can't see a physical trace of kind of 
the 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 process of the formation of the mind. So all of it's actually speculation, even yep. though it's mm. it's super interesting. Yeah. Yep, yep. Well, actually, is that going back to my boy Herder over here? Is that this, <laughs> this is this is exactly uh, what he was doing with a lot of his work? Um, was he was the developer of like ethnography and like uh, kind of collecting folk songs and folk like literature and uh, trying to preserve that because it was was disappearing during that time or, or mm-hmm. you know uh, Straussberg being the, the example that kind of w- was inspirational for that because it, it, at that time it was uh, disputed between the French and the Germans and so uh, at a certain point the French kind of had taken over and the the German speaking, kind of regional culture was was whittling away so there was like you know based on that uh, a desire to kind of preserve that material but it led into this w- much bigger kind of conception of like what poetry is and like what folk poetry is where Herder is talking about how it's the kind of base it's it's like this is the national genius of like a people or or what whatever is that you know it's their poetry right and that this like encompasses a kind of uh, way of thinking or conceptualizing things that is unique to them. And that, you know, uh, so he actually, this was like a very rich time in the philosophy of language, because this is like also around the time that Sanskrit is being like uh, the first Sanskrit scholarship and uh, philology is being done in, in the West. Um, and then also it's like, uh, it leads to overall this, this, this thing called hermeneutics, right? which is like an interpretive science. And that's actually developed largely, uh, Herder was a major figure in that. And that, that was developed for like uh, studying the Bible or studying ancient texts where it's, the question is what part of a text is genuine? Uh, you, or you can say like, what order were the gospels written in really? Like, you know, and you can do that through a, ling- a, you know, a linguistic analysis, right? Of the different words that are used. And so, you know, Herder, for example, is like the first person to correctly uh, you know, state you know, uh, or conclude which order the gospels were written in, like chronologically using this, mm-hmm. this these methods. And so there's all these different linguistic ideas that are coming together during that time uh, regarding translation theory and like how do we uh, properly, you know, take the essence of what somebody is saying and translate into a different language. And, you know, how do we uh, translate uh, what's happening in another culture uh, into something that we can understand because they're within the bounds of uh, unique historical and cultural horizons, which you know through which they conceptualize their situation in a, a different way than we might. So it's like this is where all these kinds of conversations and, and problematics uh, get developed for the first time. So you know that's kind of what Herder's big deal is is in terms of his development of anthropology and ethnography because it, you know, he was he was. Pub- you know, publishing a lot of works of folk song collections from around the whole world of different, you know, folk songs that uh, kind of bringing that into Western culture and and kind of recognizing the individuality of of, of different you know, languages and, and uh, traditions of literature. So, which is insanely progressive for the time. That's it great. should be stated. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But maybe we can nudge you forward and well, I would actually a little, a little bit. Well, further. maybe one thing. One thing is that you know I want I kind of just recommend like books as to go about some of these things that if you I, I mean there's stuff that you can read about this if you're interested. I mean I just learned all this okay. from books, so you know they're just you know they're not, they're not hard to find. I don't want to act like they're this is some secret knowledge. I I, I learned all this from reading a book. So uh, you can read just a book like The Language Animal. Uh, by Charles mm-hmm. Taylor, like would be a good one if you want to know more about that. But, but by awesome. Charles Taylor, okay, yeah, check it out. But I did want to move you a little bit forward in history a little bit because I've I've seen in your writing that you have a, a a deep interest with cybernetic game theory, and you've described your project, which is 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 this correct? That the name of your project is like I guess your wider art project is wide i was just it, w-y-d-n-a group the, consulting 
Widna Corporation. It, you know, okay. it means it means world design and analysis is is what the name I've given it. But we're okay. we're kind of like the anti Rand Corporation is we're going to kind of destroy all that stuff that they did. Right, right. I saw that. So can you talk a little <laughs> bit about cybernetic game theory and you know what the Rand Corporation is and how it, are you the how many different things I interpreted it as you know like what are you doing right now? <laughs> Yeah. No, that's what it is. I mean, it all fits together. Uh, but uh, notice, notice how it's like you're like cracking the whip and stuff. It's like, okay, now talk about like alchemical systems of knowledge. It's like, okay, now talk about like Rand Corporation and game theories. Like, okay, now talk about yeah, like 18th on. century theories of like language. It's like, okay, okay, okay. Uh, it's like it's like the persecution of digital assistants when someone <laughs> has so much information, you just expect more from them. Come on, it's like you're setting a high standard. It's here. almost as if I'm trying to structure it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well we actually we actually just the last show that's up on our patreon is um you know me me and my co-host ed ed man uh who's who's a wonderful the world's leading marxist theorist if you're not aware is, is currently living in kentucky and his name is ed um oh, really? but yeah and that's un- indisputable i mean as far as i'm concerned i'm, I'm not being ironic either <laughs> but uh his name's ed man I call him the Ed Man. I call him Ed Buddy. He's, he's my Ed Pal. He's my co-host. My, you know, he's 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 like you know the the one of the one of the greatest uh, theorists of of socialism and political economy and the history of Marxism that you'll ever run across. Uh, cool. But the last the the last show that's up on our Patreon is it was actually a, a, we did one about um, c- cybernetics uh, systems theory, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Is there is there something you wanted to know specifically about that? Well, I mean, it, you just want me to in... say what it is, or because well, I could do doing? that, but do you have four hours or something? It's like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> well, why are you the anti Rand? How would you characterize Rand in a? Because it's tied to this lull project. It's exactly. all about yeah, information but, organization. Yeah. My How general theory. Well, Rand? exactly. My general theory. This is kind of like complex to to talk about. I don't want to like uh, talk. I don't want to. Uh, act like you know that this is this is supposed to be a, a very simple kind of thing that makes sense because it probably is not going to make sense based on uh, <laughs> trying to describe it in this format. But uh, the way that you know, I consider the matter is that basically that we can go look at Leibniz's problem of uh, what's known usually as the best of all possible worlds, right? Uh, if you don't know if, what that is, is he Leibniz was in a dispute with Voltaire about like why bad things happened if there's God, you know, classic debate. But Leibniz's theory is known as uh, the best of all possible worlds theory, right? And this the most like reductive kind of like you know non way of saying it is that you know God created the the best possible world, but a lot of people don't even uh, look you know specify any further what that even is supposed to mean when they invoke this, but. What it actually, the way that Leibniz, like one of the people who, who did invoke it is uh, actually Norbert Weiner, which is why this is important is because if you never read, uh, if you don't know about cybernetics, first of all, Norbert Weiner is kind of like the father of it, or, you know, he's the guy who like wrote the book cybernetics, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you've never read that book, in the introduction of the book, he actually says that like Leibniz is the, the founding father or like patron saint of cybernetics. So that's why this is kind of important because uh, on a few different occasions in uh, Norbert Weiner's career, he would in- invoke uh, or call on the authority of Leibniz on certain things. Um, but Leibniz, and he would talk about this idea specifically, but Leibniz, the way that he does this problem is um, he's, he's thinking about world construction, right? Is that God has to create these worlds. And the way that it's set up in Leibniz is that God in his, God's imagination, there are monads, right? So, what's a monad? Like these are substances, right? But what's a substance? And like a meta, Leibniz has a very complex, like technical uh, definition of what substance is in metaphysical terms, and it changes several times. So that's a whole other topic that we could talk about for like two hours. But um, s- simply put, is like Leibniz's theory is called overall theory is called pre-established harmony and that uh maybe the the most complete statement of that is in a book called Mon- monadology right and this this theory is that uh it's about 
overcoming or like uh, an alternative to to dualism, right? And mind body dualism and subjective objective dualism, right? And how do you what's how does Leibniz get around that as he comes up with this idea of pre-established harmony? Which is going to sound crazy, but this is like what Leibniz what it actually is in Leibniz is that uh, what he's saying is that there are these things called monads, which are like the the essential like subjective kind of substance which underlie uh, or you know that when we think about things and we're dealing intellectually with things, it's like we're dealing with the substances of like you know in terms of them as the uh, the the spiritual kind of subjective aspect of a you know something that we're talking about making judgments about it but he's saying that these monads for everything uh that they are zipping around right and that they are all uh executing a teleological pr- uh, kind of program maybe uh what te- they all possess their own individual teleos right what does that mean what's teleology like this is the idea that these these things are developing according to uh, some end that guides that development. Like the, their development is structured in a particular way in accordance with the end that is their teleos. Uh, <laughs> so the his idea is that the physical uh, objective material realm of like phenomenon, like your desk or whatever, like actual stuff. Uh, and like bodies in motion, like bill, billiard balls, like clinking together and shit, is that that never interacts directly in any way with the monadic world. They never intersect in any way. And they do not, there's no cause, causal relationship between them. There's nothing where monads cause physical changes in, uh, in things, uh, physical phenomenon, like you know, in terms of like uh, Newtonian physics or anything like that, there's no interaction whatsoever. And God has set it up in a way where if you could observe somehow both sides of this simultaneously from some perspective, it would appear to you that they were moving in 100% absolute, um, you know, correspondence with one another, right? To it, such a degree that it would you know make you think that they were causing one another but they don't and they never interact and so uh that's what Leibniz believes and I'm sorry I uh, I know that that probably just sounded like complete nonsense but you gotta you know uh, I can only do so much here no, with, no, no, with, describing, great, with describing the fight of the monad <laughs> and pre it's this is kind of like you know um but with the construction of um, the best possible world, what Leibniz is really saying is that God has all these monads in his imagination, and each monad has its own teleos, and God can't change the teleos of any monads. Uh, he doesn't have that power because monads, like these, are like free things. It's like he can't, you know, restructure the whole existence of a monad. Right? It has its own end that's internal to it and inherent in it that he can't change. So. All of these monads basically undergo development in accordance with their teleos. Uh, and all God is doing is not actually just building the whole world and everything in it, is God is providing structure to the monads. And so all God is trying to do is minimize disharmony and optimize, you know, the the uh, optimize it so that everything develops. Uh, in, in harmony as much as possible given the, the teleos of all the monads that they each respectively have. <laughs> so in this sense, like God is providing the structure of the world as if it were his like thought, like he's, the world is a thought of God and he's thinking about monads. And like in the same way that uh, just the, you know, traditional classical logic is the structure of like a, our thinking like the the structure of the world is the way that God thinks, right? And so, in this sense, you could actually say, uh, you know, if you know John von Neumann and his, um, mm-hmm. you know, game, what game theory is about and stuff, is that he treats mm-hmm. he's interested in exactly this mathematical optimization problems, right? That's the, that's mm-hmm. what it is. That's what game theory is about. So if you 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 could say in the sense that 
for Leibniz, God is like a game theorist, basically, and that he's mm-hmm. engaging in like a von, von Neumann type like uh, mathematical optimization problem. And so what the whole kind of like, this is like my whole general theory of everything. So it's very, uh, you know, that I could, to describe it properly, I would have to go on for a long time, but the, kind of the point is, is that it's all about models, right? What's a model? Uh, you know, in terms of a mathematical model, a scientific model, these are conceptual constructs that we make that are supposed to kind of represent uh, supposedly how something actually works or, or describe the behavior of something, right? And the, the question is ontologically, like, do models exist? Are they literally describing or, or representing relationships or, or like, you know, uh, what are they? Or, you know, do they have a regulative status or they, you know, do they exist in a meaningful, like physical way? It's like, that's a huge question that runs through all this because that's a big point of dispute between somebody like Norbert Weiner and John von Neumann is that, and Weiner's like cybernetic, like systems theory is that models are, do have a literal, like ontological status, right? Mm-hmm. But for somebody like von, von Neumann, is he, he doesn't think, he disagrees with that. Uh, he, he thinks models have a much more kind of like limited status in terms of, you know, he recognizes their constructive aspects and their aesthetic dimension. And he doesn't really think that they're actually like literally describing the world in some real way. Um, But the whole, the whole point is that, you know, in modern and like 20th century, like neoliberalism, right? The whole issue is large scale uh, economic coordination problems, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, with global trade and and international like regulations in terms of uh you know monetary markets and you know the functioning of all these different institutions like the imf and it's a huge coordination problem that's like why all this you know systems theory cybernetics and and uh game theory all these different tools are developed in the first place is because it's they're they're related to the problem of like world construction and world planning and modeling all this these complex systems that uh you know we uh p- posit are taking place right we're 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 in you know we're looking at the world and thinking about how complex it is and we're positing that there's a whole system at work there that is like you know a mechanical clockwork and that we can get at and describe it and map it all out and say how it all fits together and so that's what that's what all these different theories um were created to do right but my fundamental issue is that these world models are not like actually real in the same like you know they're they're models in the sense of like you know uh, they're not literal things so i side with like somebody like john van and i would say that this is the position of like kant like this is the uh, you know a critical metaphysical metaphysical perspective but the way that it's developed in kind of the neoliberal economy of like the post-war era is that the model has taken over everything to the point where it's like, you know, we treat the model as if it were literally the world. And so, you know, we sacrifice like anything for the sake of, you know, making the model better as if that makes the world better. But it really, we don't necessarily need to uh, conclude that that's the case because I really don't think it does. And really, you know, that's the whole problem with our whole uh, economic approach of all this planning is that we're trying to plan out and optimize this model, which doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, in order to keep developing the model and keep improving it so that we can coordinate everything better, it's like we have to engage in this infinite expansion of the model. Um, you know, and I think social media and stuff is a big part of how that works is that, you know, it's driven always into new dimensions. Like it can be expanded infinitely and through its expansion, it, um, you know, creates new things that are being modeled, right? So like by creating all these digital uh, social media systems to collect data from us, they're actually creating all these new, uh, you know, uh, metrics and and aspects of existence to be modeled. So it's an infinite futile process of creating this perfect model, uh, you know, and, you know, in a metaphysical sense, it's, it's, that's not how it works. You can't end want- this process. You can't make a perfect model. So there, I mean, that, my, my point is that it's just like our our uh, policy planners and our, our economic planners and all these institutions is that they're proceeding from this like very fundamentally like 
uh, you know, flawed and dangerous and like destructive metaphysical error about what like the models are that they're using and like what their status is and that they're trying to, uh, you know, uh, control the world through a model. And it just like, it leads to this nonsensical kind of collapse of reality where it's like my whole, you know, interpretation is that it's like, I would call it sublime, like world terror basically is like, and you know, the, a Kantian sense is that, you know, we, you know, are dealing with this, uh, this infinite model that's being built up, 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 and that it, it's always, uh, you know, snapping back down on us. And you know, because we realize that our power to expand it to be complete and absolute is, uh, you know, that's never going to happen. So it's always collapsing back on us. And so it develops like into this permanent sense of anxiety and like, you know, terror at the, at the sense that we all feel that like the world is ending constantly. Like that's, you know, that's a, I don't know if that may sound like nonsense to you, but uh, that's kind of the direction that I go in and the way I think about things. I'm going to read, I'm going to read you to yourself because I feel like you succinctly described this point in one of the things that I read of yours and I can't remember what it was, but you write, <clears throat> there is no world, only a model of the world. Dictators and oligarchs and technocrats don't rule you. They rule simulations of the world, models of it. The rules were perfected by Rand Corporation game theorists. The figuring of you they push around the board is your identity. Yeah, I mean, that's quote, that's quote, exactly quote, it. Quote, unquote. Because <laughs> this is like, <laughs> this is exactly, you know, this is a big part of like we, what we do on the show and stuff. It's like, you know, uh, my obsession of, of like tracking all this out and figuring out all these different ways that we, we can talk about this. Because this is like the whole idea of like world's fairs of, 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 uh, you know, this is the Hitler uh, crazy uh, Nazi mega city. This is uh, all these different world fair projects. Uh, it's like there's this constant thing with modeling. If you look, look at like the 1939 like New York New York World's Fair, and it's like you, you have like a, the whole fair itself is like a model of the world. But then there's like a a, a model inside of the central uh, the you know spherical what is that called? I forget. It has a specific name, polysphere or something, whatever. But there's like, a, there, you go inside of that, it's like Epcot Center or whatever. And it's like, you go inside and then there's a fucking model inside of the model. And it's like all these models, like. <laughs> it's also very, it's very complimentary to like Fred Turner's analysis of the Family of Man exhibition, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That like, that was like a an experiment in exhibition modeling that was in essence, like contained all of the, kind of affordances and like attractions of you know what he would describe like social media turned into like mm -hmm. the idea of like everything being about individual subjectivity and like being able to observe things from multiple angles but of course that model was also within a model right and actually there were people surveilling everyone who went to family of man mm -hmm. uh exhibitions mm -hmm. in order to see how people acted in these kind of liberal liberal kind of like model constructions you know so of course the freedom was was kind of elusive or illusory if you want i i'm going to recommend some more books because if you want to read more about that there's a good author his name is tony bennett and there's mm -hmm. some good books that he has museums power knowledge uh there's Great singer too <laughs> i wish it was the same guy that would be cool but it, unfortunately it's not but this 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 guy he's he has some great stuff uh, he has a book the birth of the museum um there's Very one cool. he has called like post uh P past beyond memory evolution of museums and colonialism so there's a lot of great stuff out there written about this but that's exactly it is that uh, you can look in all these different places i'm continuously surprised in the way that it all kind of maps out and is, is connected to all uh, everything else but that's like what at the start of our conversation when i'm talking about like this research we're doing about this stuff and like permindex and world's fairs and world and world trade centers and stuff it's like what the fuck is that guy talking about like what mm -hmm. but then that this is what i mean is that basically uh there was this huge kind of like weird uh you know planning project that was conducted by like the rockefellers uh, and building up the World Trade Center as like a global institution. And the whole point was that, you know, they were, tr uh, you know, trying to make everything into a World's Fair exhibition, basically, of like, you know, where everything was a model microcosm of the whole world. And that, you know, it's like all these, you you have all the trade of the world uh, inside of a building, like a World's Fair, and it's like a model of the world. And it's, 
uh, you know, it, it's also an institution through which free trade is is instantiated. It's like, you know, it's much bigger. Like that's the point of you know our the show that me and my guy my my buddy Edman do is that it's um you know it's not a conspiratorial show in the sense of like oh this uh this person did this and it's like the cabal of these people it's like the point is is that the real story going on is like a huge like order of orders of magnitude on a totally different scale of like it's not somebody shot this person it's more like you know uh managerial like technocrats and like fabians and uh you know all these different people like basically turn the whole world into a world's uh, world trade center and that like that's the reality that we live in and it's like that makes sense up. i mean these these are like multi-generational memes right mm-hmm. and and it's it's kind of it's very interesting i mean i'm someone who doesn't have like a particularly nuanced philosophical grounding or whatever but i think it is really important work to like trace ideas or at least speculate on the genesis of ideas back to their root you know that's that's not conspiratorial at all i mean like yeah if you were to start saying okay well you know I mean, when you're talking about JFK assassinations <laughs> and so on and so forth, you could take it there, but it doesn't appear like that's what you're doing. It, it seems like you're you're tracing multi generational memes, and you kind of maybe need to do that because I mean, with areas that like we care about that maybe intersect with this somewhat. Uh, generally speaking, like thinking about like music or uh, you know, certain other cultural issues, I do find it like increasingly useful to like basically just go backwards to make sense of anything. You know, because yeah, and you're you can, right. We do exist in this kind of very mm-hmm. confused, uh, very confused state quite often, where you're like, "Well, none of this makes any sense." So, like, I've got to go back like 300 years to try and to try and pull it apart. That that seems you, you totally really do. justifiable to me. No, yeah, and, they, totally and this fine. isn't like you know, th- this is because we we do a lot of like you know we uh, base all this on a lot of theoretical stuff. Uh, this is like historicism is what this is called. It's like the historicist tradition, which is, you know, Herder's a big uh, member of that, but really it includes people like Max Weber and, and George uh, Simmel and uh, Wilhelm Dilthe and, uh, you know, Karl Mannheim. And, you know, even like Marx is, uh, you know, he has a, his historical materialism and dialect, dialectical materialism with like Lukács. And, you know, there's all these different perspectives on it. But the point is, is realizing that, theories about things and models that we use to understand the world is that those are all bound up in history and all, and like they are shaped by that history and they also simultaneously shape the history that of like, you know, they, you know, they, they construct what they're supposed to model and that in turn they get constructed by the thing they're modeling. And so it's like, you know, you can't, you can't just treat these things as these flat, uh, you know, just purely descriptive, uh, you know, statements about how things really are. That's nonsensical. So I that's mean, like what you said earlier, Holly, these hmm. are cultural, these are cultural inventions, right? Hmm. That's yeah. the point. It's like, but you know, there's, there's lots of writing about that you can, you can get into. I mean, I would recommend, uh, get, uh, volume four of Wilhelm Dilthe's collected works, uh, or selected works. And he has a great essay. I would recommend the one about enlightenment, um, history, historiography, uh, or you could get like, uh, there's a great book by Fr- uh, Frederick Beiser, who's like the greatest scholar of living today uh my hero about everything but he has a book the german historicist tradition which is another good one you can look at i mean just like you know go get simmel's essays uh on sociology read some of that it's like this is like what we base all the stuff that we do on but you know I, I, the thing is all this stuff is out there in books there's so many books that get published man it's like you know today it's like literally i mean if you go look it up it's all easily over it's like a million at least i think way over that two million three million something like that uh, books get published each year and it's like you know that's the whole thing is that there's more information being generated than anybody can you know it's just like a complete you know literally literally like a, a deluge of you know information that's pounding down on us all the time and no we have no ability to organize it anymore so all these old traditions of like systems of memory memory palaces and uh, filing systems and all these different techniques that got developed for for centuries and centuries uh, you know, we just, you know, nobody cares about them anymore. Nobody reads and learns about them anymore. Uh, nobody continues those projects forward. And all we're left with is like some, you know, people in Silicon Valley who read like these stupid self-help books and stuff 
who, uh, you know, are, are trying to give us the tools on their stupid little apps to like do all this stuff. And then you get the app and whatever it is and it fucking sucks and it doesn't let you do shit. So it's like, you know, uh, you know, they, they, everybody has a responsibility to go back and actually reconstruct and re- retrieve all of this information and all this history. And there's so much stuff out there. You don't have to speculate about anything is that, you know, you go out there, you can find books and trace it all back very, you know, definitively. So what what do we do, right? Like, I mean, you're talking about developing uh, tools to help organize um, this thought uh, and organize this research in a particular way. What what's like the we we've kind of discussed, um, you know, some of the history of of the way the world is currently, uh, without wanting to place too much pressure on the situation. Like, what what's the proposal now? Oh, I mean, first of all, I believe that. Uh... You know, if if you're familiar with just like something like dialectical materialism, is like the idea of it is that uh, we we you know historical consciousness consciousness is very important to changing the world, right? Is that it doesn't you can't change the world really without changing how you think about the world. That's a big problem in like all of the political stuff that people do, which I think is just a complete waste of time as you're out there arguing on Twitter about the stupidest stuff, like, but it never does anything. You can't fundamentally change anything that way because uh, you're, the way that people engage in all those uh, you know, political kind of uh, activities and the culture war and the stupid, stupid stuff is that that's all structured based on this whole worldview that is the tacit um, kind of like underlying premise of that behavior that is not being challenged by anybody. So, you know, there's no way to get out of that without changing how, uh, changing that worldview and, and, and changing historical consciousness. So in all these different like historicist and kind of, uh, you know, ways of looking at things or, or like dialectical materialism is that the idea is that, you know, there's a very reciprocal process. Like I've kind of, uh, su- you know, suggested a couple times about, uh, the ways that all these things fit together. It's like, the point is, is you're going to change the world by changing consciousness of the world. And that's the only thing that's going to allow the world to actually be different. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, you know, focusing on knowledge and structure and information and, you know, interpretation of that information and all that, that's like way more important than engaging in your stupid Twitter debates about like these politicians said this and this politician (laughs) said that. And Marco Rubio wrote an essay today that says, blah, 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 blah. It's like none of that shit fucking matters at all. It's all a complete waste of your time to even look at or care about whatsoever. Well, it's also a model, right? I mean, that yeah, it's like a theatrical kind of model. Appro- I mean, yeah, that kind of th- way of approaching things has been modeled by the infrastructure that people are using to argue. About so, I mean, stuff, people right? ask yeah. me, you know, they ask me all the time or time. It's like, so what do we do different? And it's like, you, the point is, is that you're not going to, you know, what are you supposed to do? Like, what do people even want to do? What do they think they're supposed to do? It's, you know, at least these idiotic kind of consequences that, you know, where nothing changes and everybody looks stupid. Um, really, you know, it's very important, I think, to to understand the world better and to change consciousness of things, uh, you know, and very and at the most fundamental levels, that's where you get the, the most profound change. So I, I think, first of all, like, you know, definitely dealing with these problems uh, explicitly as like the the central problem. Uh, that's you know, very important. First of all, is what I recommend. But in terms of like how are we going to actually structure, you know, knowledge is that's uh, certainly a very complex question. That I don't have a immediate answer to in terms of like the uh, the problem is is these hierarchical relationships and the way that relationships are rendered and modeled is that. It's a very complex situation of how categories relate to one another. And so you're engaging in these models like, you know, uh, we use a lot of like uh, SQL, like relational databases, right, which can do a kind of modeling of, of you know, different structures. Uh, or, or there's also like uh, graph databases, right? It's like th- these are, you know, tools that, uh, you know, can only model things in a very specific way, but really all information is connected to each other. Uh, you know, and th- this is kind of what I feel like some of the stuff that I was talking about during this episode uh, maybe gives a hint at, but like everything is profoundly connected to each other. In order to stand, to, in order to understand like anything going on in the world and, and or in history, it's like you have to literally understand everything else, and it's all like completely related to one another, even though it probably doesn't seem so at first. So 
how do you model like this infinite dynamic relationship? Mm-hmm. And it's like, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific answer for that yet, but that's kind of like what a lot of this research project that we're working on now. And I, I, I won't go into kind of my my preliminary ideas and stuff, but uh, that's that well, it, is definitely what we're, we what I do a lot of this research to learn more about. It seems like your Lowell um, tool might also address this in, in some way. I mean, one person we, that we... Yeah, we, well, I mean, we, I mean, just to say what it is, is that we do have a kind of a, a, a file system that we're, we're developing for it, which is, you know, uh, based on like nonlinear or, or non-hierarchical kind of views of file directories that, so it's like you can collapse file directories into one another and view them all on a single level and it's like mm. uh you know they, it's all based on virtual directories so everything is like sim, you know it can be split off in very flexible ways where you know the the you can generate virtual directories on virtual directories so you can start kind of <coughs> organizing things in this multifarious way in all these different directions to you know make more complex relationships very cool. I mean, I think these kind of interventions, you know, it's it's asking too much to kind of solve the entire problem, but to make I'm I'm trying as hard as I can. <laughs> I mean, another person that we that we talk to sometimes is Evgeny Morisov. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he's been working on a project called the Syllabus, and his main goal there was to kind of address this uh, signal to noise ratio with um, you know all of the media that we're consuming all the time. So it's essentially kind of a curated. It's a subscription model curated list where it's almost like being in a class where you have a different scholar or thinker um, kind of curating your reading list, academic, journal, podcast, kind of the whole spectrum. Um, and it's a really nice way to kind of organize the sea of information that we're all swimming And specifically through. also like scouring academic publishing exactly. yeah. for information because this is what i do that's upstream of the news exactly exactly and, like, and well the problem with that though is a lot of that stuff is also paywalled yeah i use um, can i recommend pirating on your show do you care yeah that's fine oh, no, yeah. that's okay <laughs> yeah go just go to libgen and get any book that you want or use sci-hub to get any paper that you want uh, that's just that's a big secret that'll help you out there but oh, yeah. no, no, you no. know this is one this is one thing that like one of the ways that I'm I'm thinking about things that we're trying to go on is that what I want to do is like basically use techniques like you know machine learning like uh, for OCR for optical scanning of like PDFs and, and things like that and okay. basically set it up in such a way where we're looking at some of these really interesting tools. There's a really cool one out there called Pollen, which uh, is kind of a markup language, like a next generation markup language that this guy. Uh, developed which never you know it's been around for a few years i guess never really caught on i stumbled upon it and uh, you know i think it's super cool you can go check that check that out but it, it's basically this cool markup language uh you know, it has these semantic tags and it allows you to write your own uh markup tags and stuff and it's like the way that i'm you know i'm trying to think about going a way to do this so it's like you know, you machine learning like ocr scan all these documents and then you can use uh you know have an automatic uh, semantic tagging employed uh, mm-hmm. to like a PDF or something that will then structurally break up all of the text uh, and then uh, basically allow you to dynamically regenerate books, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, made perhaps with other books to like rewrite books and reorder the information in different ways, like different views. Like if you are, you have used databases and things, it's like you have your view on your tables and stuff. And it's like, you can set up these predetermined ways of looking at your information. So it's like, what if you had a book and it was like a database and you could like view it, or set up different views of it by like chronological uh, you know ordering or uh, view it in terms of like a subject materials where it's all grouped together and different things like that. Or, you know, you, you search the book, but you don't get like it where you search a book today or a PDF today. It's, uh, you know, you get just these discrete results of like this word is mentioned X number of times and you can see each time. It would be more mm-hmm. like, you know, using some kind of approach uh you know to basically rewrite that material where all this that word is mentioned and uh put it all together into is like a single statement where that consolidates all the information in the book about that topic it's funny i was using a tool recently have you seen text sniper uh no i don't think i have it's amazing it's like it, you, I'll look if it you up. screenshot anything that has text in it it 
it basically uh, it will pr- it w- it copies the text to your to your clipboard, and I'm guessing that if that oh, consumer yeah, yeah. facing tool exists, then you know basically like visual recognition of of text on a page in a PDF is like solved. There's well, there's exciting. a lot of, there's a yeah. lot of stuff out there. Uh, another one, uh, like you can check out. Uh, I'll just recommend uh, Airtable has a, 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 a extension browser extension for doing those kinds of screenshots, those clips. And it's a very cool. kind of similar thing where it can then automate. Uh, you can set up like a, a, a script or a trigger or something to, you know, organize clips into, uh, you know, uh, tables in a database. Very cool. And, you know, and then you that has an API that connects with like Google Vision API or whatever. So you could then like do machine, like uh, OCR scanning and stuff of it. So there is like, it's you know, I think that all, of all the tools I've used, I've probably like tried like a hundred different ones at this point is that, a lot of them, or at least some of them, have some good ideas, but the way that they're like constrained in order to like uh, become products that can be marketed, and it's like the you know it never comes together in an integrated way that would really be like what we're talking about. It's always kind of like you know. Well, they probably have to worry about IP issues yeah. as well. And if this is, I mean, I assume this will be an open source project, or hell something. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you know you're you're gonna kind of not have the same. Constraints as a commercial. The same liability, let's say. Liability, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's so crazy how everything is just like so locked up. It's like, you know, think about how Google Books has all those books like yeah. scanned that are out there and they can't release the books. And the problem is, is that it's think like how they scanned the whole freaking earth. Yeah. How about yeah, that? Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes it's they cr- got away with it. <laughs> it's, it. Yeah, it's so crazy though, because it's like, you know, they're dealing with these issues where it's like uh, the Publishers who published a lot of those books originally, like they don't exist anymore. They just like went bankrupt. They they're done, yeah. and nobody really has the the rights to those books. But somebody could claim the rights and try to establish it in court, which is what they're really mm-hmm. worried about. So they can't release the books. And you know, yeah. it's like this is a really really big problem. I think that if you want to get like pissed off about something and like you know demand that the government change the law, like this is the, one of the major things that you should be focusing on because this is really really you know that's a big deal. But even if you like, you know, during the 18th century in England is that they actually did have perpetual copyright, right? Mm. And so even like, you know, well into the 18th century is like you, there were auctions where you could go and buy shares to the copyright of like Shakespeare's works and stuff like that. But that got, you know, it was a big deal when that got overturned in the 18th Sounds century. Sounds a bit like NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like that, that's a bit that, you know, abolishing that is a big deal because it, it really does change a lot and, you know. Uh, it, it, a lot of intellectual activities can just explode when that happens, when you take that away. That's like why China uh, has a huge advantage because they don't just, they don't give a shit about that. And we shouldn't yeah. either. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you should really, if you want to, you know, this is one thing you should be pissed off about in my opinion. So how do you feel about kind of like alternate models of funding um, research, writing and journalism? Because, um, you know, you've stated your your ideas around IP and open source, and I've also seen you kind of complain about how online magazines don't don't really make sense. They don't have enough funding to really support actual good writing or good journalism. So, have you seen any of the more recent projects like SA or some of these kind of like funding structures to fund research? And there's writing? lots of stuff out there. I'm really wary of stuff that gets into the territory of like, it's like, it's like Twitter, but with Bitcoin and it's like people, people <laughs> give you, people give you Bitcoins for like making tweets and it's super cool. It's on the blockchain. It's like, you know, thanks. I like, I, I, sorry. I love, the, I love you doing nerd voice, by the way. <laughs> Some meta shit right there. Yeah, it's, like, <laughs> I, it's like, no, I mean, be like, you know, uh, this is what nerds used to do in like the olden days is they would like uh, compile like, uh, indexes of like Greek literature and stuff. And it's today they're yeah. just all losers who are just like making blockchains. And it's like, go do something useful. Do some like historical research, make an index or something that people can actually use. Like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, blockchain aside, what do you think are interesting funding models for this kind of yeah, research? Yeah, like, I, is there anything happening? At, is there anything happening at the moment in terms of like different models for organizing or different things you've seen that that you're interested in or like that you think is is a positive? Because I assume that you're slightly <clears throat> disillusioned or dissatisfied with academia. Yeah, yeah. Is that I mean, correct assumption. Yeah, it's 
you know, I don't place a lot of stock in that because it's like I, I view these uh, institutions as, as, you know, the university wasn't always a, a big thing. It's like it was literally started by some monks to get like uh, tutoring sessions on like stuff in the trivium or whatever. It's like, you know, it wasn't like this huge institutionalized like mega thing like it is today. Uh, so I don't, I don't really care what happens to universities. I think that like, you know, two thirds of, of colleges should go bankrupt and just close I think down. They probably but, will, to be honest. And I, well, I think that's a good thing because I think that fewer yeah. people should go to college because, you know, there's no reason that you need to go to college to do like most of the stuff that people do. And it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of their time and it's a waste of money. And it just like feeds all of the financiers and the banks and stuff. It makes them stronger. And then, you know, makes everybody else weaker. It's like, and really there's no reason to do it because you can go on LibGen and download all those books and just read them yourself. Well, this is one area where you agree with your nemesis, Peter Thiel. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, oh God. don't even get me started on that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just being a Moving troll. Along. <laughs> <laughs> no, people don't even know how sus and shady this guy is. Like, first of all, he his like first job was at Sullivan and Cromwell. Are you kidding me? Like, come on. Like, people are sleeping on this. You know, Sullivan and Cromwell is like the 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 law firm that like did the Panama uh, Canal and like uh, sent U.S. warships to to uh, uh, um, to like Colombia and like uh, South America in order to like threaten them and like harass them in order to give us Panama forever so that we could do the Panama Canal. It's like the Sullivan and Cromwell <laughs> so set to, that up. We'll have to do a separate episode because I would actually love to have this long, com a very long conversation with you about Palantir. Knowing what I know now about your research interests, um, Palantir yeah, anyway. is fake. Palantir is fake. It doesn't do like <laughs> it's hype. Wait. Let's no, save for real. Palantir no. for part two. <laughs> I, we've done, we've been doing research on this, and it's it's generally like it. There's a a thing that exists called Palantir, and it does data stuff and whatever. But there's nothing special about it whatsoever, and it's all yep. PR hype, basically, yep. because it's a, a you know a Trojan horse for government spying on comp on the corporate clients of, of Palantir. Is that's what all it literally is? Is that uh, the point? Is is that you know. Palantir sends their forward deployed engineer who gains access to all of these companies, all their all their systems, complete access, and then literally uh, Palantir can just spy on their clients and just give them this like you know <laughs> data software that is not special at all. But it's all still PR hyped up. That's like people are like, I gotta get Palantir, and people don't even realize it's like okay, uh, uh, Alex Carp like uh, uh, Palantir is like. Guess what he studied? Guess what he did his dissertation on? Oh, wouldn't you know it's like actually Talcott Parsons and like early 20th century sociology and like American like communications theory, which is actually where all of the propaganda and psychological warfare doctrine of comes from that gets developed during World War II. So, wow. <laughs> uh, it's great that oh, this God. guy who has- Seriously, uh, screw, screw Adam Curtis. <laughs> I want to see that. Like, why can't we just see the like origins of Palantir? <laughs> no, that's oh, what we do. Uh, you know, As a video we, collage. Our, our, <laughs> our, our show is like what people I think say mean when they talk about Adam Curtis. Like, uh, you know, we're the real Adam Curtis. If you want like real stuff, come to us. Don't go to those documentaries, man. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, I, I watched one. Site. Yeah, I feel I like, watched I feel one like that, he works uh, hard. Yeah. Karen, what sorry. was it? What was it? The the one about the uh, uh, Bernays. What's that one called? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, this of the self. Of self yeah. Yeah, it was like my wife watched that, and I was watching some of it with her. I couldn't really watch it because it's like <laughs> it's all like Bernays this, Bernays that. But he doesn't mention uh, El Elmo, Elmo Roper. He doesn't mention uh, you know George Gallup or Walter Lippmann or like any of these other people. And it's like you know he's he's you know, you know giving you kind of a, a, a you know fake fake. Uh, view of things he's leaving some important things out well that's what and he makes giant leaps and well that, that, that was my critique i like wrote I, we started watching the most recent one and it's i before you know i mean there's something entertaining to it in a sense because i was like he's kind of like this weird like dj of ideas where mm. it's like all all ideas i'm somewhat familiar with because and the footage i actually is read amazing. books and like turner for example like it's clear that curtis is like big fan of devoured turner. everything fred turner has written totally and you're like but it's kind of like a neural net like presenting these things and these kind of like <laughs> ambient kind of like somewhat associative but he'll also he'll, he'll show like a, a historical 
event and then draw these kind of like dramatic conclusions from that event without really yeah but if you take away the footage if you take away the access to the archive which is like unbelievable footage right like some of that stuff is stuff that's never been televised right no the footage is amazing he just makes like giant leaps in in logic that i that i find really annoying yeah i i mean i don't like that is if you want to make some of these arguments in my mind is that you have to like go back and like reconstruct like late 19th century neo-kantianism and like you talk about like the heidelberg school and stuff it's like (laughs) you know if you're not doing that it's like you're not really saying anything in in my mind it is a weird balance though to go to talk about yeah (laughs) do you even left do you, do you even do you, left bro yeah uh, but the, but like the that's also it's a weird balance though too right because even talking about like funding models for doing this kind of research outside of academia the big distinction i think for me with curtis is like you know there are ideas that are there to be entertained and there are ideas as entertainment mm-hmm. and those two things are very different mm-hmm. and sadly they you have to kind of dance between both of them Right. Because like the idea of just funding, for example, some of the work that you're describing, which is like, you know, a very it, it, uh, and I don't mean this in a, in a in a pejorative sense, but like a very kind of pur- puritanical view of like. Yes, research. absolutely. I'm like, a, I'm like, a, I'm absolutely tyrannical about how this needs to be done. And it's like, you know, I don't, I don't care. It's like, you know, you do it the right way or you get the fuck out. It's like, I'm not, I don't have any tolerance for weak stuff. But that's yeah. the thing is I feel like Adam Curtis is an artist and they should be seen as like art projects, but people take them as kind of like history lessons. Yeah, he's like a collage, just kind of like 90s, like. And it's beautiful for vibey. that. But people take it as like, oh, I learned all of this history. It's very interesting. Or, you know, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's then interesting. people I just I like it. read it in the wrong I way. It. I think. I it. Anyways, yeah. moving on from Adam Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> Con- controversial uh subject i guess or whatever did you just have one come out or something? i don't even know i don't like, pay attention to this stuff uh, on these topics are, are you are you somewhat familiar with or do you have any um interest in ted nelson's work because a lot of the stuff that you're describing about connecting things together particularly earlier when you said something about like collapsing hierarchical categories or mm-hmm. whatever reminds me a little bit of some of the uh, of Nelson's thoughts, and like I'm, I'm like a big Ted Nelson stan. Tree diagrams and things. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, you told me you mentioned when we were like, uh, uh, we had we did a DM a while back. You were talking about that mm-hmm. Xanadu and stuff. It's mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, I, I I have been looking into that. Um, you know, just based on on your your conversation that you told me about. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm aware. I mean, uh, my. You know, I just feel in general is like computing, the history of computers went down the dark path and that it went the wrong way, right? And that, you know, something went really wrong, uh, you know, somewhere between, you know, 1945 and today. It's like they went really off track and turned into something nightmarish. And and it's for reasons that a lot of people, I think, don't even, that's not what they, why they would even think to just, uh, you know, consider it bad, right? Because you can talk about like, the main complaints that people always have about the internet and all this stuff is like, you know, uh, they're so worried about like their censorship and like, you know, I don't want to get my account banned. It's like, I'm, you know, I, I have to post my dumb things. And if I can't do that, you know, I'm censorship. And it's, I, uh, you know, it's like, that's not the main reason that I would uh, criticize any of this technology. I think that it goes much deeper than that because. Then you go and you look at, like, uh, where does the idea of, like, a distributed network come from, right? And everybody, you know, today, it's like they want to do stuff that way. They think it's about liberation and that it's about, like, you know, freedom and that you do use a distributed network and it's, like, it's it's really cool. But, like, what is that even? It's like, okay, well, that was made, invented by a guy named Paul Barron at Rand Corporation. And the reason that he came up with it was because they need to um, have a communication system that could uh, withstand a nuclear attack in order to, like, mm-hmm. launch, you know. It's, it's, like, the whole point of it is is that it's not, it's it's a way of control. It's a method of control. That's what a network is. The point of it is is that Barron's idea is to replace the idea of a hierarchical like top commander, where mm-hmm. actually you have distributed command where everybody you know at different nodes, whatever node has the most knowledge of, in order to act in a situation becomes the commander for that situation. Yep. It's like you know it's not about it's uh, it's not about uh, taking everyone and putting them in their own little thing so you're free and nobody can get at you. It's actually about coordinating uh, you know all the nodes in a distributed redundant way. But you you know people don't recognize the controlling aspect and the coordination aspect that they were designed to perform. 
But and there's you know, there's so much stuff with that of this history of how all this technology comes about where people just don't understand the actual like theoretical origins of it and like what it's supposed to do and like you know it's you know really you could th say that this stuff like you know it, it structures all of our online behavior and the way that all these communities are formed and it, you know makes it possible only for us to you know uh, interact with each other online in in particular ways and to discuss things in particular ways and it conditions all of our on, you know online behavior and it's like it, nobody even nobody knows what the actual origins of it is and like how uh, you know as Curtis LeMay wanted to you know nuclear carpet bomb the Soviet Union for like 30 days straight or something and it's like he went to Rand Corporation and he's, you know th that's where all this stuff comes from it's crazy so would you say that intent necessarily determines the outcome of whatever uh technology one's discussing or structure could it be it's the could it's be the, st the structure of it conditions so the point isn't isn't that like they made it to do a certain thing and then just because they like intended it that it somehow reproduces that intention over every use the the point is is that we're talking about networks and that you know you know we situate ourselves within a network designed to you know, structure our behavior in a particular way so it's mm -hmm. like you know it, unavoidably is that you can't escape that because it provides like the the uh, scaffolding that you know uh, makes it possible for us to all kind of act in regards to one another that's pretty cool it's also distinct from the the beer principle right which is the, the stafford the, beer the oh fuck him <laughs> <laughs> no it's good it's good because yeah no your answer was meaningfully distinct from from what beer would say um <laughs> Okay, so so moving along, and we've taken up a bunch of your time. It's been really wonderful. We're probably going to check back in with you on where this project goes over time. So our last question that we ask every guest, which is a tiny bit of a detour, but we have to ask you too, is uh, what does interdependence mean to you? Uh, I'm I'm a big favor uh, and big favor of like holistic, you know, a sense of inter, inter, interdependence because I think that everything is interdependent. interdependent. But in like a totally comprehensive, like holistic way, which a lot of like systems theory, again, we did our last show about systems theory in Cybernex and we mm. do talk about this specifically, but a lot of the systems theory stuff out there is there's a million different kinds of systems theory, but a lot of it, and uh, you know, evokes this idea of like holism and it's like the whole idea of like, we're going to, you know, everything is, everything is like homeostasis. Everything is like a feedback system from like a, a Remington Rand, like gun computer that like was shooting down like uh, Japanese fighter planes or something like that's literally what like, cybernetics is, but <laughs> you know, they all treat that as holism, right? But in my mind, that's uh, you, know, phil you know, metaphysically speaking, that's what we would call like hypostasis or like reification. It's like a, an illicit like overextension of a metaphor to give it like a mm -hmm. constitutive property where it's like that's what all of systems theory is based around, and like all that cybernetic stuff is that you know it's based on taking an idea like an, the organism, right? Or something like that. And not only just understanding it as a metaphor, but also understanding it like literally and saying that, okay, everything is an organism or everything is a feedback mm. loop. It's like, but it's not. So it's, that's the, where all these kinds of uh, things failed. And that's why, you know, even though they may call themselves holistic, I wouldn't consider them to be so. I would actually consider them to be the opposite of where they're taking a subjective mo mental model of things and they're overwriting all of reality in its various kind of independent components and they're rewriting it all in order to make it conform to like a subjective uh you know structure that exists only in their head and then you know it's very it's kind of like a violent kind of a transgression and like violation of of you know the independence of reality from our thought right and so it's like the, it's meta deep metaphorical overextension and so in that sense you know I, I would consider myself to to have a totally different understanding of holism than than those people do uh, and interdep interdependence because i i like i said do believe uh in in complete interdependence of all things in all knowledge and if, like i said every piece of information is related to every other piece of information but the you know it's it's complex it's a very complex manner in which they do so and it requires a lot of it requires the, even the methods that you use in order to think about to be self-critical and to like apply themselves to themselves in order to limit their own knowledge claims and then like you know that's very important to to do that kind of thing in order to actually understand the way that things are interdependent it's like you know what makes them interdependent does their inter interdependence come from us and are thinking about it it doesn't exist it's like there's a there's a lot of stuff to be said about that i mean i'm not going to go into a whole 
another thing now, but it's like, you know, that's why you should pick up some, some sick metaphysics books and, and look at that, uh, that material, because this is what it's all about. So we'll see you on the on the playground with your uh, trench coat open and you're like trying to sell the kids the metaphysics yeah. books. Read some harder. Hey, hey kids, check this out. I want to just recommend. I want to just recommend some books about like at least the memory, the memory stuff that just people can go for it. Look at. Uh, okay, so if you were to read only one book about any of the stuff with alchemy and memory and all that history, I would recommend. Uh, one called The Art of Memory by Frances A. Yates. And she is like the most, you know, powerful, like a highest tier scholar of all time about any of this material. And she's, you know, has a bunch of really good books. And I was I also recommend you might check out uh, Lena Bolzani, a book called The Gallery of Memory, Literary and I- Iconographic uh, Models in uh, the, uh, the Age of the Early Printing Press. And another one uh, is pa- Paolo Rosi, Razi, I don't know how to say his name, but the book is The Logic and the Art of Memory, The Quest for a Universal Language, which covers some of the stuff about Leibniz and his uh, his language projects. And there's a bunch of really good ones out there. So, you know, those are three of the of the best ones, in fact. And The Art of Memory by Yates is like definitive, like the best book on the subject. So that sounds great. That's amazing. It's yeah. also such good timing because actually there's been three people who've written to us this week that they're like, you need to make a wiki for your podcast with all the book recommendations and people's names that come that up. That sounds like a lot of work. It does sound like a lot of work, uh, but well, hopefully, we'll hopefully at least if- we'll at least add links for now. Yeah, exactly. We'll add links for now. But yeah, but, I- but yeah. we would love to have you come back to talk about um, uh, Palantir, <laughs> and yeah. I would love to talk to you about AI a little bit. We didn't really get into that so much today, but that would yeah, be fun have- in the future. Whenever I'm always free. I had a fun time, so I'm up for anything ever again. Just let me know. I'm awesome. glad, and we're very much looking forward to listening to your epics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we if signed you, up early, and I was like, "Whoa!" If you yeah, can bear we, it, we, eight be- part. we became patrons today. When you I know. when I like post them and stuff and like make the announcements, I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, get ready to get your ass fucking punished, guys. It's like. <laughs> You know the way that the way that the the, the episode that we did on Watergate opens is it's the actual the complete speech that Nixon gave about Watergate when it first dropped and it's set to um, the uh, the the uh, overture to uh, Tristan and Uz- und Isolde by Wagner like the whole Perfect. thing it's like you know and it's I, all very Wagner I love it I love just the idea that's how your po- you should make your podcast is the best way to do it. is like you want to get your listeners in there and they turn on the show and they're like it's gonna be like Chapo Trap House and they're gonna blah 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 and it's gonna be so funny but then like actually it's just they have to listen to like an operatic overture of like Richard Nixon for like fifteen minutes <laughs> so so thanks so much for joining yeah thank us. you for this joining really us fun. that's been that's been comprehensive and wonderful. Hope to yeah. Uh, hope to hear hope from you to again. Host you again. Exactly. We'll have to get on to Palantir and AI the next the next chapter. Bye. But yeah, take care. Bye, Ciao. guys. Bye. 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 Bye.